So John chapter 2, this is the wedding at Cana, Jesus' first miracle. Please listen as I read the word of God. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And Jesus said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you, you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first Were this first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples and they stayed there for a few days. This is the word of the Lord. So as I said, this is Jesus' first miracle. A problem is brought to him by his mother. He calls her woman at a wedding where he turns wine or water into wine. And so a lot of alliteration there, W's, not in the original language, but in English. And what, what we see is this actually, this miracle John calls a sign, and it kicks off Jesus' ministry. It sets him on a collision course to the cross. And what John does here is he reaches back into the Old Testament, brings it into his day as Jesus looks forward to the cross and then beyond that to when he is the bridegroom wedded to the church, us, his bride. In this, we see a Jesus who far exceeds any expectations, who solves our biggest problem of sin and the wrath of God against us, turns it into joy, who illustrates to us, come to me, ask of me, but yet then calls us to do whatever he tells us. This text I want to look at in two parts. As I said, what's in your bulletin are notes. The outline for this sermon is the story in the first part and the sign in the second part. So two parts. And if I can build on that, the story and what we can learn from it and the sign and what it means for us. The story and the sign. Well, this is a story of a wedding. And as we see in this story, there's all kinds of expectation that comes along with a wedding. And that exists to today. And as I'm always reminded of my own wedding as I'm preparing a bride and a groom of whom I've married a couple in this room, a few of them, of all the expectations that come along with weddings, all the details of, of things that have to be done, all the decisions that have to be made, how many people to invite, who to invite. If I invite this person, then I have to invite these 10 people. And the list goes bigger and bigger. In our story today, it's, it's talking about wine. This is fermented wine. This is alcoholic wine. We have decisions to make around those things. Do we have an open bar? What will people think if we have an open bar? They think we're immoral. If we don't, will they think we're cheap? Do we not have alcohol? 
If we don't, will they think we're cheap? And if we do, will they think we're stuffy? And all kinds of these decisions and details that we work through. I was thinking back to Susan and I wedding some 18 years ago. And I was 29, so I was almost 30, which means I was out of the house for quite a long time at that point. And we didn't want an expensive wedding. We wanted money to buy a house, and we didn't want to strap our parents with the expenses. So we tried to do things reasonable but nice was kind of the thing. We wanted it to be very nice but reasonable. And what that meant is we took care of a lot of the details. And so Susan had a her friend's mother be the photographer. I had an uncle be the videographer. We, we did things like this. But the one detail I didn't want to really leave up to chance was, was the DJ. We didn't have a way to play music. We wanted to have our first dance and then the mother-son dance and the father-daughter dance and fun. There's dancing at weddings. And so we hired a DJ. And this DJ came with his wife to Susan's place. And we met him there. We went through the details. And I just felt at such ease with this guy. He was, he was professional. He was responsible. He assured us. And so of all the details of the wedding, this was the one detail I thought would be done right. I wasn't sure about the photos or the videos, and those are pretty important. And so we get to the reception, which is at this restaurant uh, on the Miami Bay. Beautiful place. And there's no DJ. <laughs> And I was just dumbfounded. We were late, of course. We're the last ones to the reception. And so music should have been already playing. And we look around and nothing. And so I call the guy. And long story short, he just got the wrong date. And I was mortified. What are people going to think? <laughs> What's it going to be like? I was really upset trying to enjoy this great day, but getting upset. And then I had people come alongside me and calm me down. And a cousin of mine had a, a, she said, I have some CDs in the car. Let me see what I have. And so she had this one CD that would be appropriate for the occasion. It was just instrumental music. And so there was a song on there, Endless Love, from like the 70s or 80s, instrumentally. <laughs> That's what we danced to. We didn't get to dance to the song we wanted to dance to. And you know what? It was okay. It was okay. It's <laughs> still married. Still married. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. And that's a funny story now. And what I remember is how beautiful she was then. And so, and still is, obviously. But that's not, you know, the, it's not like it ruined the day, but all kinds of expectations. And what we have here is a wedding with all kinds of expectations. And in the Middle East, and particularly in that day, these are small towns. There's no technology. There's no entertainment. This is a big deal. It's a week's worth of celebrations, a wedding in the Middle East. And that sounds weird to us. Like, why are they celebrating for a week? You know, our wedding was days long because I had family fly in from all over the country, mostly New York. And they came in before the weekend and left after the weekend. So there was all kinds of, the activities just go on and on. And in this setting, the groom's family was the one who was providing for all the, the details. And so to run out of wine, really in an honor and shame culture as they are, is a big deal. It actually will, would speak very negatively about the groom's family, like can they or can he provide for the family he's starting now? Mary's there. And she's mentioned first, which says she's really the, the, the primary relative that's there. She's mentioned even before Jesus. Jesus and the disciples are almost like an afterthought. And we see Mary gives instructions to waiters, servants. So it's almost like she might be like an assistant wedding planner. And you all know when you have weddings and you get your friend to help with the details, like she's handling details, obviously. She's mortified that this friend, this family, whoever it is that's related to her probably is going to be shamed at this event. And she turns to her son and says they ran out of wine. He just like kind of throws a problem on him. 
And before we get to his response and all that, how did she know? And what was she thinking? Well, she certainly knew and remembered that 30 years before, the angel had come to her and told her, your son is going to save his people. He's the foretold Messiah. Imagine having that in your mind for 30 years. As events were happening in the birth narratives, when the shepherds come to it, it, Mary, it says about Mary that she treasured these things in her heart. Years later, when Jesus is, is in the temple and they thought they lost him for two days, and, and they're like, how could you do this to us? And he says, why were you worried? Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? He says that to his earthly father, Joseph, by the way. <laughs> and it says, Mary said, and, and she treasured these things in her heart. And you, you moms know, as you see your kids growing up, there's, there's things and moments that you treasure in your heart. And the context here is she's remembering. She's remembering the promises of God. She knows how she got pregnant, and it wasn't through Joseph. And so here, 30 years later, it's almost like she's like, what are you waiting for? <laughs> and again, I'm Middle Eastern, and I know how these families think. And if you've ever seen a, my big fat Greek wedding, that's... The Mediterranean world, and Susan's Greek and I'm Arabic, and so that could exist in, in, in my family in particular. I know these moms, and I know Jewish moms from growing up in South Florida telling their sons, come on, it's time, all right already. But she, whatever it is, I don't know what she knows. I don't know if she thought Jesus and his disciples, there's I think six or seven of them at this point, like maybe they'll go out and get wine. Like, I don't know that she knew he was going to invent wine. But she did know he could solve the problem. And she knew that based on the promises of God. And so, here's the thing. Is this a big problem? Well, it's certainly societally a big problem. But it's not life or death. It's not like somebody's going to go to the hospital or get arrested or lose their home or their job. It's, it's a detail in life. A detail that could happen to anybody. A mistake, a mishap. Does it really warrant the creator of the universe to fix this little problem? She obviously thought so. She brought it to him. It's a big ask about a little thing. And yet, Jesus does it. And I just love that the first miracle our Savior does isn't a healing. It's not a resurrection. He's not casting out demons or calming storms and seas. He's not showing up the Pharisees he fixes a normal problem at a normal event where people are going to have a good time. And do you believe your Savior, your Creator, cares about those details in your life? Cares about the car you drive and maybe need a new one? Or about your job? Or if you'll make the basketball team or the baseball team you want to make? Or do well on your next test? Do you think those things are things he cares about. See, there's, there's, there's two problems about in, in America when, when it comes to crying out to God for things. On one hand, there's the prosperity gospel where people think, again, God's going to make you rich. So they're asking for every little material need. Now, I don't see that here. But we could suffer from the other side of things, which says we don't bring the daily things of life to God because we leave... We, it, this is too small for him. He won't care about this. I think this text today shows us he does. At the request of his mother. But he does have an odd response, doesn't he? There's kind of three layers to this odd response. The first is he says, what's, what's this got to do with me? <laughs> And people are like, wow, that's a weird response. In the Jewish, it's really, literally, what's this between me and you? 
which in English would be like, how is your problem my problem? This is a phrase that demons say to Jesus when Jesus goes up to cast the demons out of a man, the legion of demons, they say, what do you got to do with us? It's the same phrase. Then he calls her woman. And pastors are always tripping over themselves to say, oh, this is a term of respect. It's not meant to be disrespectful. And of course, it's not disrespectful. I mean, Jesus honored his father and mother. He sinned none, never. So it's not disrespectful, but it's also not a word that any Jewish man would use for his mother. Nowhere do we ever see that. That he calls woman. But there is a clue in him calling her woman because in in this gospel of John, this occurs twice. Here's an interesting fact for you. Mary's name's never mentioned in the gospel of John. She's either referred in the third person as the mother of Jesus, or in the second person, Jesus, when he addresses her, he addresses her as woman. And it occurs at the end of Jesus' ministry at the cross. And what John is doing is he's linking these two events. So Jesus, as he's about to start his ministry, that's going to catapult him to the cross, he refers to his mother as woman. And then at the cross, he looks down at John, he looks at his mother and he says, woman, this is your son. Then he looks at John and says, this is your mother. What is John doing? Is this, this, is, this is literature. He's connecting two events. He's tying two things together to say, as Jesus Christ's ministry begins, it can only end one way. It's a beeline to the cross. It's a collision course that will set him on a direction where the wrath of God will be poured out upon him. And I think that explains the response here. On the one hand, he could be calling her woman to say, don't you understand, in asking me this, the relationship changes. Yes, you'll always be my mother. But if I do this, and when I do this, I'm on route to the cross where I become your Lord. This is a word that Jesus uses for people he heals. When he says, he, he says, woman, your faith has healed you, made you well. So, so it, it's, there's a separation in the term. It's certainly a term of respect. But John is signaling something here. There's a change in Jesus' ministry which changes the relationship. I think that's why Jesus says, my time has not yet come, and we, we're confused about this. And this is another thing that John does in his gospel, that Jesus is always saying, my time has not yet come, my time has not yet come. And then there's a moment where he says, my time has come, and then he goes to the cross. But what does it really mean? Like, does, does Mary change his mind about this? Has his time come, or has it not come? What I think it is, is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you have the account of the temptation of Jesus where he's tempted to secure salvation apart from the cross. You remember this? So Jesus is baptized. The spirit descends on him like a dove. The father says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then he goes into the wilderness to be tempted. He has to pass the temptation as a human to be the new Adam to take, uh, to then secure salvation for us. This is what Christ has to do. John doesn't mention this. But if you think back to the temptation, what are the the temptations? One is Jesus is hungry, right? And he says, Satan says to him, turn these stones into bread and eat. Why couldn't Jesus do that? Because he had to live this life as a man. He had to go through life with the normal temptations of life to be a sympathetic high priest, tempted in all ways we are yet without sin. Jesus was hungry. That's not a sinful thing. But if he made stones into bread for his own benefit, he's using his his divine powers for his own benefit to overcome earthly difficulties, and he never did that for himself. Cast yourself off the mountain, and the angels will catch you. 
In other words, show your glory to the earth so you don't have to go to the cross. They'll see your God. If angels come down and get him, they'll see, right? No, he had to do this as a man. Bow down to Satan, and Satan will remove his influence over the world. No, he has to go to the cross. Christ knows as he does this miracle, it sets him on that path. And I think what we're seeing here is the humanity of Christ, because John doesn't mention that temptation. But I think here what we have is a moment where Jesus recognizes in doing this miracle, everything changes. Now, he, he as God certainly could know everything, but as a man, we know his, his omniscience was limited. And I think it's beautiful that Jesus' plans come, come about because of request of his mother. In other words, his time had come. And it's almost like his mother knew it. I mean, think about it. He's been baptized, which is his anointing, making him the Christ, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He's been tempted and passed the temptations. He's gathered followers, and John the Baptist says, he's the Christ. His time had come. <laughs> I think he gets a nudge from his mother. That's what I think is going on. And she understands his response, which tells me it was almost in his response she could tell he was going to do it. There's no dialogue here. Right? The dialogue is, they ran out of wine. <sighs> My time hasn't come. What, really? And then he gets up. And she looks at the waiters, the servants. Now, she had to say this, right? Because this is nuts. Like, like, like she's obviously able to tell them what to do. And they got to do it. Because otherwise, this guy says, serve that water? You lose your job. So do whatever he tells you. Fills up almost 200 gallons of water, 100 to 200 gallons of water into these water jugs to the top. Nothing was added to them. Serve it to the steward or the host of the event. They must have been shaking, huh? <laughs> Especially in that culture. And it's the best, most delicious wine this guy's ever tasted. It is wine, guys. I, I don't know if, you know, I, I know there's been, since the temperance movement, it's this, is, no, it's unfermented, it's grape juice. Unfermented grape juice was invented 150 years ago. They had no way to store juice. It would go, they don't have refrigeration. <laughs> it's wine. Psalm 104, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man. Ephesians 5, 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But yet, 1 Timothy 5, 23, no longer drink just water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. So obviously there was something in the fermentation process that helped with ailments. It's wine, and it's delicious wine, and they can't believe it. And that's the story and on its own, what I think we get from the story is a beautiful picture of prayer. I mean, once again, Mary doesn't even really ask Jesus anything. She just brings her problem to Jesus. And he meets the need. And he meets the need far exceeding anything she could have ever imagined. And there's always this question in Reformed people get, well, if God is sovereign and you can't change God's mind, because you don't change God's mind, guys, just so you know. Like R.C. Sproul says, what could you tell an almighty, infinite, all-knowing being who's good? And, oh, I didn't think of it that way. I'll change my mind. So if we don't change God's mind, why pray? Well, as, as R.C. Sproul says, the same God who ordains, plans, and brings about his plans also ordains the means by which he does it. And he has told us to pray. And when we don't understand that, think about your kids if you have kids. Now, you're, 
good parents who are going to do good things for your kids, but you still want them to come to you with their problems, come to you with their requests, show gratitude to you, show you love, and that's what's going on, I think. And back to the point I made, does God care about the small details in your life? I think Christians can have this thought that, once again, the physical doesn't matter, only the spiritual matters, and so all, the only thing that matters is we're going to be saved. And if that were all it were, praise God. But it's so much more than that. Jesus says to the, in, in Matthew 5 or 6, you know, Consider the birds. They don't have to plan, and God feeds them. Look at the fields, how they're clothed better than Solomon. God takes care of those needs. Is he not going to take care of your physical needs? These things like what you wear or will eat? He says, if you being evil know how to do good things for your kids, what parent who when asked for a loaf of bread would give their kid a scorpion? And you're evil. Don't you know your father is going to give you good things? Once again, I love that this miracle is what could be viewed as insignificant. Again, I know for there it was socially serious, but it wasn't life or death. It wasn't legal. They weren't going to lose their, go to prison, and Christ meets the need. But there's so much more to this miracle than the fact that Jesus does a miracle, that he suspends the laws of nature, suspends the laws of chemistry, it shows he's God, yes. He cares about the little things, yes. So bring them to him. John calls this a sign. And he says it's the first of the signs. Now, the other gospels use the word miracle. They use the word sign once in a while, but it's a miracle. Jesus did these miracles. But John is very explicit and specific to say a sign. So what's the difference between a miracle and a sign? Well, a miracle is just what happened. A sign tells you that the miracle has meaning. It means something. It's communicating something, and there's an intention for you to understand what it means. So the miracle is water turns to wine. What's the sign? And John, in his gospel, in the first half of the gospel, they call this the book of signs. There's seven signs, and seven's a significant number. Three years of Jesus' ministry, first half of John's gospel, seven signs, seven miracles. I have them in your bulletin. That's part of the notes I gave you. You know, there's another pattern of seven in John's gospel, the I am statements. And the I am statements often interpret the sign. Not always. But when Jesus feeds 5,000, multiplies the, the, the bread, what does he say right after that? I am the bread of life, right? There's, there's a sign, and then there's an interpretation with an I am statement. Here, Jesus turns water into wine. Later, he'll say, I am the, the true vine. When Jesus opens the eyes of a blind person, what does he say? Not immediately there, but what would be the I am statement? I am the light of the world. Right? And he makes this clear in John's gospel. He says, don't you have eyes to see and ears to hear? And then he opens eyes and ears. When Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And so you see signs are interpreted. There's meaning behind them. So what's the sign? Well, there's a few things going on here. First, and probably the shortest I'll say on this is the sign is it's at, it's at a wedding and this is a hugely significant paradigm or theme in the Bible is a wedding scripture begins with a wedding and it ends with a wedding the pinnacle of creation is God making Adam and Eve and joining them in marriage Jesus says that's a marriage and then at the end of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, chapter 19, 20, and 21, it's the wedding feast of the Lamb where we're reunited with the, the new Adam as his bride. He's the bridegroom. In John chapter 3, he'll be called the bridegroom. And so this is showing you a central theme of the Bible. 
it's so significant that Jesus' first miracle is done at a wedding because all of history is moving toward a wedding where he's our groom. The next and the longer sign is the wine itself. And it's significant that the wine is at a wedding. And so wine brings joy. Okay? That's the Bible. That's just what the Bible says. <laughs> Isaiah 25, 6, speaking of like the great marriage supper of the Lamb and, and the eschaton. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. The picture of Christ's return and a new creation is talked about with aged fine wine. So there's, there's joy there. In the call to worship, Isaiah 55, 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Jeremiah 31, 12. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion. There's joy. And they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain and the wine. So wine is a picture of joy. And that's why it's a picture of what's going on at this wedding. There's joy there. And so certainly Christians can see this, right? And that's why in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what's sort of the parallel story to this? There's no wedding feast, but Jesus says you can't put new wine into old wineskins. You see, the analogy is rich. It's deep. And that's why when, Israel, uh, when Mary says they have no wine, it's a bigger thing than just this wedding. She's speaking as if she's Israel, saying, we have run out of wine. And Jesus comes to bring new wine. Just like John 1, grace upon grace. That God poured out grace upon the old covenant community, but it was always meant to be pointing toward the grace and the joy and the blessing of when Jesus would come. But... Wine also stands for what in the Old Testament or in the Bible? Wrath and judgment. The same thing that stands for joy stands for judgment. And it, it, it's, it's not immediately apparent when you read in the Bible about the cup of God's wrath being poured out, why wine is being used as a symbol and an image of judgment. But let me read you Isaiah 63, 3. God is saying this about the judgment. I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. God is saying, I'm doing this, this judgment. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments, stained my apparel for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. So what is he saying there? What's a wine press? The, the grapes were thrown into this giant vat, and how did they get the juice? They stomped on it. And what would happen as they're stomping on the grapes? It spatters, and it gets on their garments. And God says he's doing this in judgment to people. And he says this, that the last sentence, if you didn't catch it. He says, why? For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. Does that blow your mind? It's, it's so subtle, we're missing it. Vengeance and redemption being the same thing? Vengeance is bad news. Redemption is good news. One act, bringing about both. So that's Isaiah, Old Testament, New Testament, Revelation 4. And an angel came from the altar who has the authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it in the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle. It's, a, it's an image of, of the end of times when it's like a sickle going out through the earth and chopping off the wicked and throwing them in a winepress and getting stomped out in God's judgment. 
It's not a pretty picture. Jeremiah 25, 15, Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath. Now Jesus asks his disciples when they say, Let us sit on the right hand and the left hand. Can you drink the cup that I am to drink? And then in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says to the Father, Father, take this cup from me. And then at his crucifixion, thought I had it there. Let's see. John 28, John 20, uh, 26. When Jesus saw his mother and his disciple, whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, his time had come, I'm adding that, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. He's on the cross. He looks down. He calls his mother woman again, just like in our passage. And now he says, I thirst. And what, what do you get when you thirst? You get water, right? What do they give him? A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So in the miracle of the changing of the water into wine, he turns water into wine that brings joy at the wedding. But at his crucifixion, this other event, he really needs water and they give him sour wine because it's the wine of God's judgment that he's, drink, that he's drinking, the cup of the wrath of God. And so this is part of the sign that Jesus' ministry kicks off at a wedding where he doesn't really, in his humanity, feel like he wants to do this because he knows it's going to set him on a collision course to drink the cup of God's wrath. But from that, he will be united as the groom to us where we drink fine, sweet wine in abundance. And so what you see is there's, there's a, a, a big story and a little story, Right? And this is what John does. This is why I teach these things. He says, this is a sign. I'm showing you what the sign is. And so here, here's the thing. This miracle, while it's more than turning water into wine, it's about how redemption comes to play and how the, the judgment that's poured out on Christ, that he's the one trod in the wine press brings us the wine of joy. It's, it's more than the water turning into wine, but it's not less than the water turning into wine. And what I mean by that is, even though this is about the big picture, and even though the most important thing you need is for God to solve the problem of your alienation to him, that you are sinner, and I put myself in that category, and that's what it takes, that sacrifice, for Christ's blood to be spilt, for God to crush him. Isaiah says he was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. He does that so that he does care about the little details in your life, like not having enough wine at your wedding. Everything good in your life is bought by the precious blood of Jesus. He gives you redemption, but he gives you more of that. He treats you, his father treats you like you're a child. Does God care about the little things? Do you think he does? Do you have examples in your life where he cares about the little things? He cares about the little things because he solved the big thing. And if he can solve the big thing, the little things are just little things. Ask of him. I told you at the beginning about my, the wedding and endless love, cheesy 70s or 80s song. So we're married in the morning, reception in the afternoon, and then we're going to fly to Jamaica. And so for, you, for all you young couples that get married and you go on your honeymoon for a day or two, that is smart because we were wiped out. 
And we get to Jamaica, and it was like 10 o'clock at night, and we missed the shuttle to the resort where we were going, and so we waited like an hour, and they send this little vehicle that we're cramped up in, and it's 100 kilometers to, I think we went to Ocho Rios. Yeah, we flew into Montego Bay, went to Ocho Rios. 100 kilometers is 60 miles, so I'm like, oh, good, this will be an hour. No, no, two hours, because you're on narrow mountain roads with goats and chickens, and it's dark out. And so we get to the resort, it was Sandals, at at like 1 a.m. or midnight, we are whooped, it's our wedding night, and we're just tired and carsick, I'm carsick. (sighs) We just wanted to go to sleep. But we kind of got to unpack a little. So I go in the, and we check in our room, and I turn the clock radio on. You kids don't know what that is, probably. <laughs> you got to listen to a radio station. There's nothing to stream. Endless love on the radio. <laughs> now, what are the chances? I mean, I was in a pot. We got married in 2004. Who was listening to Endless Love in 2004? Nobody. But that was the song we, we, we happened to dance to. And then that's the first thing we hear in, the, in this uh, resort. Now, I'm, I'm uh, honest to God, I'm not kidding when I tell you this. We're there a week or five days. I forget how long we we're there. At the end, we're packing up the room. Same thing. Turn on the clock radio. Music coming on. Endless love. <laughs> now, it's not like this was a loop of endless love. I promise you. We've been listening to this radio station all week. We hadn't heard it again. I'm just saying, does God care about the details? Like, I don't know what that is. I just think that's my heavenly father smiling on us in our marriage, saying, yeah, so you didn't have a DJ. You know, I'm with you. He cares about the details, and he cares about you. It says the disciples believed. That's what it says. It says they believed at this. Mary obviously believed in her son. And whatever knowledge they have, they believed up to the amount of knowledge and revelation they had. And it says this was the first sign that was done and Christ's glory was revealed. Because when God acts on your behalf, it is glorious. Get, get that. He acted on behalf of people and it gave him glory. What is the chief end of man? You know it, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And he is glorified in our enjoyment of him. And we need to remember that's bought at the cross of Christ. So the question is, do you know him as your bridegroom? If you do, he solved the biggest problem we have. He says, ask of me, and he will do exceedingly abundantly more than you can imagine. But he says this, do whatever I tell you. And then he empowers you to do it. We're about to go to the Lord's uh, Supper in in a minute here, but um, beautiful scripture text to go to the Lord's Supper with. Let's pray.